Hi, I'm Katie and this is episode 62 of Ornamentations, which is going to be a holiday spectacular because I am feeling the Christmas spirit. My tree is up, my home is decorated, and I am all high on fresh evergreens and spices and holiday spirits, so prepare yourself for some holiday stitching overload. I also have the giveaway winner from the last episode, which I'll share with you at the end. I have an update on the silk wrapped pearl finishing packs for the recently posted tutorial. And then we'll also be looking at some of the things I want to stitch this season as well as what I'm currently stitching. So my tree went up this weekend. I will be putting in some photos and video at the very end of this episode. So stay tuned if you'd like to see it. And honestly, tree day is one of my absolute favorite, favorite, favorite days of the year. It doesn't beat out Christmas, but oh, does it come close because not only do you have that wonderful evergreen scent, I always use a fresh tree, but taking out all the ornaments that I've made or have been given or have you know, treasures that I have found is like meeting old friends that you haven't forgotten, but that you haven't seen in ages. And it's just such a pleasure to see them again and enjoy their company. It took me about three hours to decorate the tree, but I really enjoyed it. And then just basking in all the sparkly lit glow while I stitch in the evening is just awesome because I have it set up right by where I stitch so I can enjoy it all season long and I just oh, I love it. But I know that the holidays aren't universally joyful for everybody. They can be stressful, they can be lonely, and if that's your experience, I hope that you're finding comfort and joy in your stitching and that all of my Christmas spectacular is not too great because, oh boy, I, I, I'm just all about Christmas to a truly crazy degree. But a few business items before we get on the stitching for today. There's a link to sign up for the Cardinal Kin interest list in the description for this episode and in the listing for on my shop. I haven't taken it down even though it's sold out so that you have an easy place to find it. Please do add your email to the list if you're interested. It really helps me know how many kits I need. And then also I have started a notification kit after many, notification list after many requests for the silk wrapped pearl finishing kits which i will be restocking very soon but if you'd like to know the minute those hit my website there's a link in the description where you can enter your email and then also in the listing in my shop for this item the tutorial is now up although the finishing packs are currently sold out i will be restocking them and if those sell out too i'll restock them as long as there's supply although if you have any pearl and stash say from katie's greens which provided materials for this ornament uh, those work equally well the finishing packs are just intended to make it really easy for you to try out this technique also that is a great green i will say although of course i think that because i picked it I would like to note that I did really underestimate the demand for this and I am really sorry about that. Um, the thing is I had no frame of reference here. I was just guessing because I haven't done a standalone finishing pack before. They've always been attached to a specific project and I really didn't know what demand for that would look like. It was incredibly high. You know, the day before I was looking at everything I had and thinking there's no way I'm going to sell all of this and then Oh, it all walked out the door in under an hour. It was crazy. So if I had realized, I would have put a lot more stock in. But there's more on the way, and I hope to have those for you quite soon. For my international customers, please note that I don't ship internationally in December. Too many things go wrong. So you are very welcome to order, but your order will be held for shipment until January 1st. So just know that there will be a wait on that if you're an international customer. 
a lot of you have previously expressed interest in different kind of finishing and edgings beyond just chenille or crack and the more commonly used choices out there. That has had me thinking because silk wrapped pearl definitely worked beautifully. It's fabulous. It's very easy to use, but it's also not the only embroidery thread out there that could be added to a cross stitch finish. So I've got my thinking cap on and we'll see what I can come up with. Although there won't be any more tutorials this year, they are a great deal of work. One of the great things about these, what I like to call specialty materials is that so often they will do the work for you. So I posted on Instagram last week, a better photo of, well, not a better photo. It's just more, you could see the whole thing of the stump work doors from my mirror as seen here on the notebooks. These are also still available and in the shop front and back and the leaves are all silk wrapped pearl really done with the same method that was taught in the tutorial back as well. I didn't really do very much. I just couched and stitched down the pearl just like I did here. And then the thread gives you all the texture, all of the color, all of that fabulous effect. It really is amazing. I love silk wrapped pearl and I am so excited that so many of you are willing to make the jump and try it with me because it really is fun. I think you'll find it's very easy and it can provide a really beautiful, stunning, unique finish. The double scallop as seen here, I think is just spectacular. And then, um, oh, just in case you haven't seen the tutorial, I wanted to show you all of the ornaments that I made for it. You know, this is why I don't do a ton of tutorials because this is the kind of development work that goes into them. But just to review, so I finished the bijou ornament. I started on Druid Blue and showed you in the last episode. So this is bijou white gold glint, which is in the Noah's Christmas art kit. So it's another idea of something that you can do with the thread if you've got the kit and you'd like to make better use of your threads. Oh. That is so pretty. I might actually stitch this motif again. I love it. I think it's really striking. You can't see the shimmery glow of the white gold glint in this, but you can see how much it stands out on the beautiful Druid Blue Linen. Just as a reminder, these are all motifs from the Modern Folk Embroidery Pattern through the Bitter Frost and Snow that I've just pulled off and stitched on different counts of linen to give different effects. Also got two red ones, oh, very holiday. The double scallop that I showed you in the last episode, this one I already gifted to my mom and I had to pull it back to show you today. And then the two that I am keeping for myself, the rest are all gonna be gifts, but I did keep two for myself, of course. They were the green ones. And then this is stitched with the 103 that is in the finishing packs. But this one is stitched with a coordinating color of Bijou. And unfortunately on camera, it just looks quite dark, but it's called, it's color called Malachite and it has this beautiful emerald shimmer to it still not really showing up very well, but it just glows. It is oh gorgeous. I am obsessed with Bijou. We'll talk a little bit about more about that later, but those were just so much fun. I've really enjoyed them. And then having ornaments of varying sizes really fill out a tree. You can put them in little holes and it just, oh, fabulous. I love it. And then I do have one more extra that will be going up on Thursday, December 14th in answer to some questions and requests that I've gotten. I hope you'll enjoy it. It's not a tutorial, it's more tutorial adjacent, but check my channel on the 14th and I hope that you enjoy it. To pick up a few things from the last episode, 
I have nothing to show you on Jack's house. I put that one away as a whip without taking a single more stitch on it because, oh, once I had huffed the fruitcake, there was just now going back, I took that out to just knock the house out, do a finish, and I'm just like, oh, no, no, it falls over for me, time for a holiday. So we'll see that again at some point, but it's not going to be now. And oh, to answer the question I asked you the last episode, yes, there was tons of interest in the crystal doves, and I will work on developing these as a kit for the next year. Although um, the beaded leaves won't be included, that's the kind of thing that pushes this over the line from doable to not doable because one, I can't get the materials, but two, even if I could, that would add six extra components that all have to be sourced, packaged, and kitted. And it would double the length of the instructions because not only is there the working of this, which is more complicated than it looks, unlike the rest of the dove, which is actually very simple, the weight of the beads and the wire also requires an interior support structure. Can't see that from the finish because I did my job quite well, but that just would push it over the edge into something that's not doable. I did want to explain my reasoning on that because I know why something is or is not a kit or is or is not included can be quite opaque and some of you express specific interest in that. It will still be quite spectacular without the leaves. And just to reassure a few of you, this is actually very, very simple. This is another example of letting the materials do the work for you. If you can bring your needle up through fabric and then down in a straight stitch, you can make a dove. True story. And I think my instructions will be up to the task. They are very detailed. So, doves coming for next year, I hope. Um, there are some problems I have to solve on that, but I'm going to do some work and we'll see what my explorations in that direction take me over the season because I will get started on that. I do have another finish, so, which, oh no, I hadn't started this in the previous episode. And that is Stacy Nash's Duck the Halls Pinky. Oh, love this. And this was a super quick, easy little piece. I stitched it on 45 count Himalayan fog. I will put all of my threads in the information specifically on the ribbon, which is easily and readily available in the description as well as for the edging. We'll talk more about that in a second. Although I would note that this conversion is really not dependent on the exact shades. This would be a great example of a pattern where you can make use of what you already have in your silk stash. So for example, if you have Noah's Christmas Ark and Cardinal King kits for me, you would have everything you would need to stitch this and your finish would look much the same. You have to add the ribbon and the linen on the chart, of course. I did also add some beads. I will put those in the description, but they are the same seed beads from the Noah's Christmas Art Kit and you do have extras. So if you finished your Noah's Christmas Art and you'd like to make some use of your extra materials, this would be a great way to do it because in this kit you got your white, your green, you could use this for your gold, although um, it's a little brighter than the one I've used here. Or you could sub out the Bijou white gold glint for everything and that would look fabulous too. This is dependent on a combination of classic colors, red and green, supported by a few complementary neutrals. And so if you've got a red and a green that you like, use them together and you can stitch this and it will look great. You don't need the exact same threads that I used. Although if you would like to, those are listed in the description. These are my colors and I used Bichu white gold glint for the snowflakes. I thought they would pop on the Himalayan fog. One thing that doesn't pop on the Himalayan fog is the lady herself. I used creme for that 
I mean, she shows up, but she doesn't pop right off the ground like she does in the model. So one solution for that would be to either sub a flush tone. So this is 2080 because I use Surfane. That would be 080 in 103. I don't really like doing that because it's just a little too realistic. Well, at least for me, they're almost the same color. <laughs> I'm ridiculously pale. And I was thinking about why that is. And it's, I think that I'm just so used to my people being off-white, it's how I always render them in stump work. That's kind of where my brain goes. So I wanted to use creme. Another option, if you feel the same way, would just be to put this on a slightly darker gray, say Wayfarer's Cloak. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I did also start another of the Fruity Bitter Frost and Snow ornaments. So this is Renaissance Gold on Wayfarer's Cloak. It's quite striking, although actually to me it says Halloween a little more just because the darker content comes through so strongly on the gray. But Wayfarer's Cloak would be another great option for the same colors if you wanted the lady's head to stand out a little more than she does on um, I've been saying Himalayan Fog. This is actually Hazy Summit because it's the 45 count. And then, so I added a crystal edging. This is my beaded looped edging. I have a tutorial up on this. I will link it in the description, although I should note again that I didn't come up with this. This was the brainchild of the incomparable Joy Hayward. She's a professional finisher. She does work for Brenda of Brenda and the Serial Starter, among others. Her work is beautiful and she came up with this and I saw it and was just like, oh my gosh, I have to do that. I have, I just love it and I've used it on a lot of finishes since. So this, I think I said is a crystal silver shade. It coordinates beautifully with the light gray linens that I really like. So give it a try. I'll put sources on that in the description. And I did also add the same beads and style edging to my Noah's Christmas Ark to Doves. The kits on this are still available, although their numbers are dwindling. They may not hold out until the next episode. So if you'd like to give this beautiful piece a try, links in the description. I was really excited to see that so many of you answered the call and decided to take a leap of faith with me on this one. After seeing the last episode, I know it doesn't show well on camera. It is truly beautiful in person though. So I had actually originally thought that this really was complete in itself and it didn't need anything extra, but I wanted to just give the crystal silver shade a try and see how it looked with the linen. I was actually planning on cutting this off after I showed it on floss tube. It's just like, yeah, the ornament doesn't need anything. And then I saw it all together and it just, oh, it sings. It adds this delicate little extra that perfectly complements the delicate shimmer, sparkle, and just kind of nature of this ornament. It has the same qualities that make this ornament sing. So Cardinal Kin, I didn't keep for myself. I gave that to my mom for Christmas last year, but this I kept, it is my favorite. So um, the crystal color silver shade is gray, but it barely has any color to it. It's just the slightest, slightest touch of gray. It's a very subtle effect, but it is a beautiful one. So information on that is in the description and it goes beautifully with all of my preferred grays, Himalayan Fog, Cloister Cream, and I would urge you to give that a try. Oh, one more thing about um, Deck the Halls. I was going to do green on this. I am just dying to do an embellished crystal hanger with green um, round pendants. As you can see, I've got some here. 
but I put a green metallic braid hanger on this at first and it looked so top heavy. I was just like, oh, that's not the one. And so I went for just the tonal edging to finish off instead. I think that's great. It lets the attention stay here where it belongs on the embellishments, on that great bow, on the beautiful colors. So I'm going to have to stitch something else to try out a green embellished ornament hanger. That tutorial is also up. I'll link it in the description because I am just dying to have one of those on my tree. You know how I am about green. So we'll see. I might just default to a, another motif from Through the Bitter Frost and Snow since that's working so well for me, but stay tuned on that. And let's get to my current holiday stitching because I do have a new start since I saw you last. I went ahead and started twice. Heartstring Samplery, baby, it's cold outside. So this was an example of not fully thinking things through. It happens to all of us, but I was just absolutely raring to go on Smoke Signal, the new 37 count legacy linen. And yes, I do have the new 48 counts on order. They haven't arrived yet, so I'll show them on my next floss tube. And I was thinking that Smoke Signal would make a really lovely, rich backdrop for these bright colors and that this would be perfect. And that I would then do what I want to be the complimentary piece, Parson Brown from Not Forgotten Farm on Cloister Cream. Because those two linens just look gorgeous together. I think these would be a fabulous pair of display. However, I did a center start on this and that was not wise because I ended up starting with white instead of with red with a new color of linen, you know, takes a hot minute to kind of feel out what works best on it, what doesn't work best. And I should have started with the reds because I had some really specific ideas of what I wanted to use on that. And so I was roaring away on the roof, came to the reds and found out that they don't get along at all. I mean, you could do this, but it's not the best choice. The red and then the brownish tones are fighting each other a little bit. So I don't think this is really going to show up on camera, but on Smoke Signal, this red, which is Goblin's 235T, is just a screamer. And the linen is a little more subtle, a little, little more earthy, and they just look like they're singing from two different hymnals, as a dear friend of mine likes to say. So I ended up restarting it on Cloister Cream. I'm going to use Smoke Signal for Parser Brown, which is really what I should have been thinking all along because those earthier tones will look great on this. So those are two colors I've already picked. That's going to be fabulous. Oh, I'm going to do the words or the framing elements in one of the brown bijou colors. Oh, is that going to be fabulous or what? These are both going to have some sparkle added to it. So I'm really looking forward to that bijou in the black core. So the white core bijoux have been discontinued. The white gold glint that's on Noah's Christmas Ark is unfortunately one of them. The last available wholesale supply was purchased by me. It's in my kit. So if you want it, gotta get it from me. I'm afraid it's actually really unfortunate. I'd really rather that color continue to exist than for me to have an exclusive on it. And this is my Bijou collection. So these are all the black core threads. Do you think I have a sparkle problem? I don't think I have a sparkle problem. I mean, I've got like repeats on several of these, but I do really go through them, especially on my holiday stitching. Malachite and then green agate in particular, I just... Oh, I think I've gone through at least six spools of malachite because these rich, glowing, 
jewel tones. I mean, does that just scream belongs on a tree or what? So yeah, I've got a lot of bijou. I use it and I am not ashamed, but I'm going to add one of the browns to Parson Brown. It's going to look fabulous. I think it's going to sing on the smoke signal. And those are just more of a natural color match than that screamer of a red was with um, smoke signal. So I restarted it on cloister cream and I think this is much more successful. Not every color is a match for every linen and this really lets the red star. So this is my start. I'm going to add sequins to the roof as well as some, I have some snowflakes shaped sequins. I'm gonna add those around the house too. That's gonna be fabulous. I also sub out the trees for the more branchy style that's on Parson Brown and some other charts uh, like Brenda Gervais, Bells of Christmas uses the same style because I don't really like the piling of those trees on top of each other. I think just a couple like taller branchy trees would look really good there. So going to make a few tweaks to this, but I think it's looking great and it really lets that bright, really vibrant pinky red star. So this is a partial conversion because I haven't picked my green yet, but it will only be five shades as was a uh, Stacey Nash. So if you're looking to try out silk and Noah's Christmas Arc, which is also a great starter to silk, doesn't float your boat, this would be another great choice because there will only be five colors in the end. The chart calls for two whites, but I think it'll be fine to use just one. I'll leave the background house plain and then sparkle this up with sequins and so there'll definitely be distinct roofs. So that's how I'm going to handle that. And then this is the Goblins, which I was just so set on using this because it just screams vintage Christmas to me. I have a set of vintage shiny bright ball ornaments in exactly this color. I have a really love-hate relationship with it in my stitching because it's a screamer. It does not play well with others, but in a chart where it can really be the star, it's perfect. And I think that this is going to look absolutely spectacular. So I hated having to redo some of that block stitching because oh, I did the entire roof on this first house. And that was actually one of the other reasons I thought smoke signals to start with, other than I was dying to use it, because I am dying to use it, was that the white would pop more on the darker ground than it does on the cloister cream. But it shows, it'll show even more once I get it all sparkled up and being able to use the red I wanted to use was really the most important thing here. So it's a little perverse that I, I'm all stuck on two charts with so many freaking words in them when I hate stitching letters, but I guess that tells you how much I love these charts because I'm willing to stitch all those letters. No carries. So yeah, I'm hoping to have a finish on maybe it's cold outside for next time. We'll see. And then I really want to do Parson Brown to go with it. So I'll post the colors I have in the description for this episode, but um, full conversion won't be until next time because I haven't picked a green yet. Although, of course, run ahead of me and pick a green if you've got one that you'd like to use and fill that conversion out. You don't have to use the same green. So, oh, fabulous. I'm so excited about these two. But I thought the next thing I would show you is just a brief little chart parade of some things that I would like to stitch this season. So I am definitely going to start Stacy Nash Wonderful Life Pink Keep Drum, which I'm gonna stitch on Himalayan Fog. I've already picked the colors. This will be the Christmas in July floss tube kit, so I do really need to get stitching on it, and I'd love to have it up and displayed this holiday season. I love the way she did this with the greenery and the little stand. So I'd like to try something like that for this. So definitely need to get started on Wonderful Life Pink Keep Drum. And then we'll see how much I can get through because Sampler Symposium is coming up on me. I have a lot of work to do for that. So 
How much I'll get through this holiday, I'm not entirely sure, but these are some of the things that I'm thinking about. So, Quaker Christmas Samplings by Carriage House Samplings. I want to do the top one that's more ornate instead of the bottom one. And I would like to shade the greens. These are some that I've pulled and I'm thinking about. So, oh, I think it was just about a year ago, I shared Marianne Tiller's version of the Simple Harmony box in which she had taken the single color motifs and shaded them in greens. It was fabulous. I absolutely loved it and I'm sitting there like, oh my God, why didn't I think of that? I've been dying to try it out ever since. So I think this is going to be the pattern. Stitch that on cloister cream. I know I stitch everything on cloister cream, but you know what? I love it and I will not apologize for that. Also from Not Forgotten Farm, these are just PDFs that printed out. Basket of Cheer. That is really quick and simple. And I think if you used stronger greens and put it on a really rich ground linen, this might be able to stand up to a green crystal ornament hanger. So stay tuned. Definitely have to stitch that. That would be really quick and easy. So that's a must. I also have her, here comes Santa. Not really sure why there's a goose. I might just stitch the Santa and the trees as a standalone ornament. Actually, I think that's certainly what I'm going to do, but I dig it. And then a request from my mother is the Prairie Schooler Nutcrackers. I'm definitely going to stitch some Perry Schooler Santas. I did not pull those charts. I have to go through those and decide which one I want to tackle first because they are perfect for Katie's sparkle prim. And then, oh, winter salt boxes. I did this one last year on Druid Blue. I think the other, though, I'd like to do as an ornament and, oh, predictably on cloister cream because <laughs> I stitch everything on cloister cream. Oh, and for Himalayan Fog, Stacey Nash, Holly Basket, Sewing Roll. I think this would be a great kind of supporting piece in a display. So you could make it into a large pillow and then have it kind of like as a larger backing piece with some smaller pieces in front of it. I always like to think about how things might go together in a display. And then not cross stitch, but two things that I bought from the Cheswick Company are waiting for the sleigh so this isn't a kit anymore unfortunately just the pattern but i can source all the materials that's fine i did a standalone reindeer of hers i put it out every year i love it and so i would really like to do the trio and i don't know put them on the dining table maybe with some trees and then this is so cute whiskers and his pearls water isn't he adorable so that's her 30th anniversary ornament for this year it's new and this one is a full kit one thing about the cheswick company i love them i have tons of their ornaments on their tree my mom and i make them and give them to each other pretty much every year for christmas we give each other kits too i always make plenty for myself because i love the cheswick company the instructions are very, very bare bones. They're not inadequate. It's just if you need more ex extensive instruction and you want to have lots of details and step by step, that is not what you're going to get from this. They're not particularly complicated, but for something like this, if you're not a sewer and you've never done something like it, just beware on that. I've never had any problems with it, but I'm a very figure it out kind of person, so it doesn't really trouble me, but I did want to just let you know on that. And then a few other things I wanted to show you today before I do have an update on AKGIT, I've still been stitching on that as well, is a piece that was made by my grandmother in the 50s. It now belongs to my mom. She was kind enough to lend it to me. It was from a kit. And this is actually what got me started on all of my sequined and sequin and felt ornament adventures. This is Theodora's last year's ornament kit. She's still available as well. And there are very detailed instructions included. Oh, the wings. Wow. 
never get over the wings. This is to hold Christmas cards. It's Santa Mail. And this is all sequins and beads on felt. And I just love the vintage style and the sparkle. I have traced most of these and made them as standalone ornaments on my own tree. So I thought I'd show you. The crafting gene is strong in this family, especially when it comes to Christmas crafting. But my mom puts that out every single year. I've been looking at that since I was a child and when I came to starting my own collection of Christmas ornaments as an adult, that was actually where I looked first. That and my mom's um, flocked paper ornaments that we showed when she was a guest last Christmas. I'll link that episode in the description. So I've come quite a long way on that. The other thing I wanted to show you were a few favorites from Christmas's past. Most of these well, no, not much. Some of these, about half, were made by my mom, and I treasure them because they were gifts and made with love. But the first I wanted to show you, and none of these are new. I've shown them all on my channel before, but I hope you won't mind the trip down memory lane. This is not a tree ornament. I hang this on a door. This is a beaded mistletoe. And before anybody asks, no, this is not a kit or a tutorial. Trust me, you do not want to do this. Quite frankly, it took me five Christmases to get through this because I just felt like I was making leaves forever. I keep making them and wire them together and then it would still look all scanty. Oh my God. It was miserable to make, but it is sparkly and fabulous. And now that it's done, I love having it hang out, I'll, hanging, I'm disappearing a little bit up against my sweater, but it is fabulous. It's also huge. It's larger than my head, which is why it was miserable to make. And then I wanted to show you some ornaments. Oh, so the first is um, Prairie Schooler Santa's Night. And what I actually wanted to show you about this is the difference at the Briolette edging, which I actually don't think will really show up on camera. So this is silver shade and this is just plain crystal. And as you can see, it's just the slightest, slightest touch of gray. So yes, I made two. One of these will be a gift. I give a lot of homemade things at Christmas because it just gives me joy to make for others who will love and cherish them and especially, you know, might not make them for themselves. And then, oh, this is such a special ornament. My mom made this for me. It, a lot of it is over one, all the lettering is, and it's a house. She gave it to me in Christmas 2016 to commemorate my new home. It's got my name on it. Merry Christmas and new home to commemorate my first Christmas in this home, which I love. And so this is really special. It always gets a primo spot on the tree. Unfortunately, I don't know what the pattern is. Oh, she signed it. Love mom on the bottom. So this is a really special one. Just love. And then, oh, this I showed you last, this is a Christmas gift from her last year. And you're gonna have to forgive her. She's my mom, she's very partial to me. I don't claim this appellation for myself, but this is her take on a Judy Whitman design, JBW designs, I think it was French country crown. And she even did a little crystal edging. That's all over one with goblins. My mom is better at over one than I am, honestly. She is always talking about how she's not in my league, but oh, I would not do that. So also gets a premium spot on the tree. And then this is one that I think the technique might be a tutorial next Christmas. Definitely won't happen this year, but so this is Candy Cane Wishes from Brenda Gervais. I stitched this myself, but the edging is really fun because those are just beads that are strung on wire and then couched down around the edge, which is actually simple enough. The only reason you might need a tutorial is that you have to secure and hide the wire ends because 
otherwise super simple, but it's this detailed, really pretty edging that I think you could do a lot of variations with. So I've been thinking about that too. And then the last oldie that I wanted to show you is a Cheswick company. This is Pooh Bearer from the 100 Acre Wood series. And my mom made him for me. Look at that face. Isn't he adorable? He got a premium spot too. I just love this little guy. So she's actually made me multiple ornaments from the 100 Acre Woods series, but this was the first one she gave me and it's still my favorite because it is just so cute. And then I'm actually going to pause this video and pull a couple of things off the shelf behind me because you'll probably get questions about what they are. Okay, so these are a couple of just little pillow ornaments in just a plain little tray. And then I added some gold faux greenery that was purchased. And then I strung just gigantic crystal rounds on wire, added a sequin to top it off so that they would look like berries, and then just wired those together to kind of add a little pop or rent to this because that was really what that needed. And then the two pieces are a brunch derby. This one I did a long time ago. If you know the name of the chart, where to find the conversion and the details will be in my episode guide, which I'll link in the description. They have links back to all the conversions from different episodes. And then this is my version of joy and good cheer. That was one of last year's holiday kits. So the conversion's been retired and it's no longer available, but I think together they make a really nice little paired display. And then next to it was the Christmas in July kit. Oh my gosh, I am totally blanking on the name of this chart. I can see the cover. Oh, I can't remember. It's just one of our new releases. You all know what I'm talking about. And then, um, oh, Stone House. So I had it framed and then this was the Christmas in July kit, so conversion was exclusive to that. Now we're quite tired, but yeah, I love that stone house with the little embellished wreath. That's on Legacy Linen 38 Count Himalayan Fog with an original silk conversion. And then standing next to it, I stitched this. I had this in mind as a complimentary piece too. Oh, I'm totally blanking on the name. Oh, this is bad. I actually did that as a kit. I can't think of it. And then this is Marion Bright. Also Brenda Gervais, but one of her very old patterns. I think this is only still available directly from her on her website. I do love the kind of more hand-drawn look of the piece, although the chart itself is computer generated. So this is a great little Santa. The conversion for this and all details was in episode 41, Katie Sparkle Prim. And so he's got some little crystal pearls as berries on his branches, but the real fun is here. I added staggered sequins over the block stitching at the bottom. So this is what I'm talking about doing for Baby It's Cold Outside on the roof. It's gonna look fabulous. Whoever said you can't add sequins to cross stitch. It works fabulously well. It looked great on Thomas. It looks great on this. It's going to look fabulous on baby. It's cold outside. So I did these two to be complimentary pieces. So that's what's behind me. The wreath is a kit from Pearl Soho that I further embellished. So I'm going to pause this again, put those back, and then we'll take a brief look at AKGIT. So I've got kind of a dilemma with this. I normally put away my bigger projects in December so that I can just focus on Christmas stitching. It always really creatively helps me recharge and then I come back to my big projects in January feeling refreshed and with a new energy for them. So I've put my casket stitching away and we won't see it again until the new year. But AKGIT, I'm a little more hesitant to put away because I don't want to lose momentum on this. I have come 
so far and the only way to get through something this big in any kind of timely fashion is just to plug away on it consistently. So uh, I'm a little afraid that if I put this away for December that I'm not going to regularly spend the same amount of time on it. But oh, I just want to do holiday stitching. So you know what? I think I will. I'm going to finish that second lozenge, which is now in progress. And then I think I might just leave this until after Christmas. So since I saw you last, I put that third medallion in at the bottom along with the letters that go around it. And then I have done a good chunk of that second lozenge. So if I, I think if I can just finish that off, that might be a good stopping place. And then I can return to AKGAT in the new year. Hopefully not having lost momentum on this and just feeling really energized, but then that's the back. All very clean. Because the thing is, I would really love to have this finished and hanging on my wall. It is such a spectacular, amazing piece. You know, I just, oh, I can already see where I'm going to put it. I'm just... I want this to be done and the only way to do that is to spend a lot of time with it but the siren call of Christmas stitching is strong I think that's probably gonna win out but I would like to finish today by sharing a couple of videos with you and these are both linked in the description and the first is a new floss tuber. So my own teacher, Trisha Nguyen of Thistle Threads, she, her Cabinet of Curiosities course, as I've discussed on here before, is what started my own journey with, with surface embroidery and really shaped me as a stitcher. She has finally joined Floss Tube and she has her first one up, which is part of a new series she's calling Travels with Trisha. So it's not a chart parade haul kind of floss tube. She does introduce herself and tells you a little bit about her own journey with embroidery as in the introduction to this episode. But most of it is about her visit to the Gold and Wire Drawers exhibition in London. So Trisha takes a lot of research trips to study historic pieces, to visit makers and study their methods. And she's started filming some of those so that she can share them all with us, which is awesome because I'm not gonna make it to the Golden Wire Drawers exhibition in London, worst luck. And there are some amazing, amazing pieces in it. She did a fabulous job filming it. I'm gonna have to ask her how she does it because what I always get with video is a very flattening effect and yet she manages to capture a lot of the incredible dimensionality of these pieces. So there are some very well-known examples of gold work embroidery fe featured in the exhibition. One of them, the Lord Chancellor's Burst, is a famous, famous piece. I have looked at photos of it a million times. And it wasn't until I saw Trisha's video that I realized just how raised it was. Those are practically sculptures hanging out on fabric. That's not regular stump work. It was crazy. And so the quality of the video of the exhibition is just exceptional. And it gives you a really good sense of what these pieces actually look like and as someone who tries to convey that on video on my own channel I can tell you it's really really hard to do and so whether or not you're interested in gold work embroidery if you like eye candy go check it out because there are some really really amazing examples of gold work embroidery that are featured some of them are very famous some of them are less well known but they are all fabulous so check it out i will link that in the description and then i also want to share a video that a friend sent to me it's from dior and it's about the making of the most recent couture collection the current designer at dior i'm gonna butcher her name maria grazia Chiri, 
is a really fascinating woman. She has a real love of embroidery in the same way that we love stitching and it's less commonly seen in a fashion world. She loves crafts, she loves handwork, and she cares a lot about preserving crafts and traditions and methods that are at risk of going extinct. It's really couture that keeps them alive and the funding of the big couture houses like Dior and Chanel. And the, so a lot of her collections are designed to both highlight the work of the ateliers involved and to challenge them to come up with new technical innovations. That's why I enjoy these videos so much because techniques on display are just so cool. And so the video takes you inside the ateliers. It's not a video of the runway show. It's about the actual making of these pieces, which are really exceptional. I think this is probably your best collection yet. And it shows the workers at work making these pieces and showing you the incredible skill that went was involved in it. Um, I mean, there was some great embroidery, but the hand pleating that was being done as a sewer totally blew my mind. I mean, they were doing like multi-layered hand pleats on a curve and it's perfect with really difficult materials. So if you have any interest in sewing and handcraft and cool stuff and eye candy, check it out. Um, it also had the effect of making me wish I was walking around all day in all kinds of like pleated capes and I wanted like a gold macrame cape and that's a little outside the budget so won't be happening but oh it was the coolest video I've already watched it twice and I think I'm probably gonna watch it several more times this week alone it's extraordinary and it's really cool to see the workers at work which also, if you've never seen the documentary Dior and I, which I think is still on Amazon Prime, watch it. It's about the making of Raph Simon's first couture collection of Dior. And the collection was a masterpiece, but what was so cool was the extended, you know, film length look inside the ateliers, meeting the workers, seeing them at work, and seeing how these amazing pieces are made start to finish from the first pattern drawing to the first twall to the final fittings to the models walking down the runway. It's really cool for anyone who loves making, who loves craft, or who loves textiles. So those are my recommendations of things to watch this week outside the usual Vosterbers, which, you know, still watching those as well, but those were just some special things that I have watched this week and thought you might enjoy too. That brings me to the last thing I have today, which is the winner of the linen giveaway from the last episode. That is Mary New York 89. I've commented on your comment. Please send me your mailing address. I will get these out to you. Please enjoy them. So right after this, I'm going to insert some photos and some video of my tree and my decorations. We're going to be taking a special look at the table chop tree that's right next to me in the next episode. But so this is about some of my other decorations and my big tree. For next time, we will be looking at all of the holiday things. So what are my whips? What are my starts? Do I have a finish? And a special look at a really special piece that's very close to my heart. And then in the meantime, there will be my little floss tube extra up on December 14th. So watch out for that. There will be a restock very soon, I hope, of the Silk Wrapped Pearl Finishing Pack, so please put your name down for the notification list linked in the description if you'd like to be notified when these come back into stock. Still available are Theodora and Noah's Christmas Arc 2 kits on the holiday front, my notebooks and postcards in the shop, and then, oh, almost forgot, there are just a few spaces left on Queen Anne's Pin Pillow, the upcoming class. First lesson is posted January 1st. 
So if you would like to join the pin pillow, there are only a few spots remaining. So I hope you'll think about joining us. So I'll see you next time for even more fun and fabulous and super sparkly holiday stitching. And until then, happy stitching.